excited to welcome Christian Wells from Riverside to talk on his color logic. Thank you. Hi, it's great to be here. Um, yeah, my last name has been Williams, uh, but I'm getting married uh, out in the desert in a few months, and we're changing our name to Wells. Um, this opportunity means a lot to me, so I want to briefly start with the journey that led here. I just completed my PhD at UC Riverside with John Baez and Mike Schulman, and the past six years have been beyond anything I could have imagined. Uh, just coming across the country for some big dreams and then meeting so many amazing people who share those dreams and learning a beautiful language and joining in some great projects. Two years ago, Topos was opening and I was thankful they let me hang out even though I wasn't involved in the projects. And uh, I was finishing my last grad project and trying to figure out what, to, what I really wanted to do for my thesis. And one night, David Jazz Myers was showing me the visual language of colors, strings, and beads uh, for a double category or a, a pro arrow equipment. Looks like this would be a bead. And uh, how many uh, big ideas in category theory could become amazingly simple and clear in this visual form, uh, almost like child's play. And I was uh, completely blown away and I realized that this was my dream for category theory to be a language that was truly for everyone. And so I got excited about uh, developing an education program based on this visual language, but I needed to do original research for the thesis. And so these structures called pro arrow equipments are framed by categories. Um, what was really surprising is that even though that experts have known for decades that these, that, uh, these structures unify or systematize the basic concepts of category theory, somehow we had yet to define the whole universe of these structures. We had yet to define the meta-language of the languages that we use, that we, in which we do category theory. Um, so I took a leap of faith and I followed the visual intuition and um, just had some basic faith that it would turn out to be simple. And actually it did. And in fact, the meta language uh, has a visual form that is a simple self-reflection of the two-dimensional language, uh, where the third dimension is inner to outer. Um, so uh, it's like a flow from an inner bead to an outer bead. and. Um, uh, the past year or so, I've been realizing that many uh, concepts in category theory that are normally regarded as very advanced and uh, only experts really grasp them enough to, to use them in everyday uh, research and development, um, I have been realizing that they, um, these concepts do become simple and clear in this meta-language. So my hope is that this can bring the full power of category theory to, to the whole community. So uh, I'm excited to present to you color logic as a unified language for both uh, education and research of category theory. So for education, in the two-dimensional language of colors, strings, and beads, uh, the subject of category theory can be presented as generalized logic. Uh, there's a simple three-part story that starts in binary logic of sets and relations and then generalizes relations to be matrices of all kinds of values. And then we form uh, composition and identity to, to form categories. Um, so I'll give a brief presentation uh, at the beginning about this education program that I'm proposing. Um, and then for the research side, um, these structures form a coherent three-dimensional uh, structure that's, that's like a triple category, but it's, it's not quite. Um, and, sorry, these structures are known as pro-arrow equipments, but I'm giving a new definition of them um, and the name bifibrant double categories. And this image here, <coughs> the way to see it is that each of these colors is a whole double category. And 
Double categories have two types of relations. There are vertical profunctors and horizontal profunctors, and they are uh, different, they're distinct. And um, the outward direction here is uh, double functors. So the way to see this whole cube is that inner squares of this light color flow outward uh, to form an, one of these outer squares. And in the perspective of these structures as logics, the squares would be inferences. So this would be a transformation from one system of inferences inside to another system of inference outside. And so uh, we can understand this three-dimensional structure as being the language of meta-logic. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm gonna start with a brief presentation on the education program and then mainly focus on the basics of the, uh, the meta language. Um, all right. So I wanna clarify um, what I mean by this education program. It's about more than just the uh, visual language of string diagrams. I'm proposing that there is a canonical presentation of category theory based on how we construct universes of categories. It's a three-part story that requires no math background because it begins in binary logic, the logic of sets and relations. Um, and we generalize, we can generalize relations to be matrices of all kinds of values, um, forming these logics of, of matrices. And then we can freely generate uh, composition and identity to form categories, and I'm calling that active. Um, I have started a wiki at colorlogic.io and I'm looking for collaborators in its development. So for binary, the part one of this education program is binary logic. So this is the double category of uh, sets and functions in the vertical direction and relations and entailments uh, for horizontal morphisms and squares. And uh, I'm proposing that we could begin teaching binary logic even in preschool or the very beginning of school um, because the, uh, the philosophy, which is often implicit in category theory exposition, um, which would be explicit here, is that we understand the world by making connections. Um, or even like ev every thought that we have expresses some kind of connection between things. And to empower people or help them understand themselves, all we need to do is give them the language in which to express and explore those connections. So rather than sitting a child down and having them count apples and memorize symbols, we can um, introduce them to the idea of a relation and then take them you know, out on a hike and ask what relations do you see in the world? Um, so, um, then, oh, and the other, um, the other significant um, aspect of this is that once someone is familiar with the idea that, they're, um, that thoughts are connections and these connections transform, um, they can see that their reasoning is two-dimensional. Um, and I think that we don't really know what's possible in math education if someone were able, were aware of uh, their reasoning being two-dimensional from, from a young age. Um, so the, um, this expands um, because we make all kinds of connections. A, uh, a relation can consist of more than just uh, yes or no. A relation could be a distance between things or a set of ways between things or actions or all kinds of things. So there's this natural generalization that, um, that once somebody's familiar with uh, a relation as a matrix of truth values, then you can say, what if we filled that matrix with other kinds of values? Um, and then once you have this language of matrices, we can then form categories. Um, so what you need to motivate is that if we want, um, if, 
if for logic to be complete, we want connections to compose freely. So if you're trying to think about um, sets of ways to get from one place to another, if your relations are sets of ways from one place to another, um, then if inside of each type was, if each type was just a set, then there would be no way to get from one place to another inside of a set. So you could get from one city to another, but when you're in a city, you're stuck in one place. Um, so to complete a logic, um, we form monads. Um, but you don't need those fancy words. Um, you can just motivate this idea that we want types to be self-related. If you're trying to reason about distance, your types are not just sets. You want them to be spaces. Um, so what I'm proposing is that the whole language of categories can be systematically presented as matrices with composition and identity. Um, and in the visual language, each basic concept, categories and functors, profunctors and transformations, uh, each has an intuitive visual form. So functors have this pleasing uh, visual intuition of sliding one bead through another. And similarly, um, profunctors have a very simple uh, visual form which looks exactly the same as categories, except now you have arrows, uh, arrows that are jumping uh, between categories. Um, so when you give this story, um, you're also giving them the, the full power of the, the computational language of categories. So this uh, two-step construction of matrices uh, with composition and identity defines generalized logic as the Cohen's calculus. Um, so the idea is to compose relations between categories is just like composing relations between sets as this, uh, this matrix multiplication. Uh, we just need to add a, uh, a quotient by the inner action, the action of the middle category for associativity. Uh, and dually, to form uh, transformations between these relations. It's just like in binary logic when we say for all x, y, p of x, y implies q of x, y. Uh, it's the same formula. We just need to add uh, a condition or an equalizer for naturality. Um, and from these two formulas, we can systematically construct um, all of the other fundamental ideas of category theory, like limits and co-limits or the Oneida lemma, all of these things can be, um, can be derived in this language. So in this way, um, category theory can be presented as a three-part story, um, as um, logic beyond the binary. And um, I think that a lot of people um, don't like math because um, they're presented a certain limited uh, conceptual framework and they sense um, that the um, that binary thinking is is not sufficient to um, to really encapsulate the world and so I, I'm proposing that we can bring category theory to the public as a language in which you can build whatever you can create and explore whatever language you want um, so this is a education program that I am um, beginning. Yes. I was going to ask, uh, what is the intention behind calling this access logic? Um, that is just a temporary name. It, it was that um, the difference between type theory and category theory is that um, types in category theory types act on relations. Categories act on profunctors. And so when you compose, you got a quotient by that action. And when you transform, you have to uh, equalize by that action. Yeah. But maybe you could call it compositional it's logic the or versus the, action. the action. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, if you, if you have ideas, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Schopenhauer makes a four part distinction between ways of knowing. Um, is, of is this short? Yeah. Is, okay. <laughs> two of which are um, uh, moral, 
knowing and empirical knowing. And then the other few are uh, algebraic geometric and logical. And I feel like this, this, what we typic the math that we typically teach in like middle school, elementary school is really algebraic geometric work, where where the the quantities that we manipulate are related to quantities of shapes and forms and and sort of things in the world, and we don't really get to logic yeah. until much later. So yeah. this is not you're not just proposing <coughs> that we, you know, teach logic in a different way. You're te you're proposing that we teach logic at all, which yeah. you know, that's that's kind of a much more radical proposal. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. Any anything else? So, of course, this is a whole subject in itself. It's just that um, I just finished the thesis over the past two years, and it's, it's the main thing that is developed right now that I have to present to the community. So that'll be um, the main focus today. But I'm happy to, to talk about the education program afterwards. OK. So the research program has to do with these two-dimensional structures. Um, so the basic notions of category theory are unified or systematized in the language of a bifibrant double category, also known as a pro arrow equipment or framed by category. Um, so we construct and explore all kinds of objects in category theory that might be higher dimensional or might be more general. But if you pay close attention, uh, I'm claiming that virtually always we, we are using um, this language um, because it is the, the simple structure which unifies uh, the basic concepts of category theory. Uh, and so because this structure is so fundamental, I think that it needs a much simpler name, and I'm proposing to understand this structure as a logic. Um, so the idea is um, we can think of objects and tight or vertical morphisms as types and processes, so like sets and functions, for example. And we can think of loose or horizontal morphisms in squares, so the QIR here, as relations and inferences. Um, so you can read this square as if Q relates X to Y, then, uh, then I transforms that to an R relation from F of X to G of Y. Um, so it's just the simple language of connections and transformations. And this really does correspond to a logic because you can think of this bar here as like an inference rule, the way that people normally draw bars in deductive logic. Um, so notice that we're not talking about general double categories. This adjective bifibrant refers to the notion of representation. Um, and this is the action of processes on relations to push forward or pull backwards in time. So like a, a function induces a graph or a co-graph. A functor induces a, a dual pair of representable profunctors. And I want to emphasize that this structure is essential both for the expressiveness of a logic and the coherence of metalogic. So for the expressiveness, to define basic concepts like limit and colimit, they are defined to represent certain profunctors. They're defined as, as representing objects. But moreover, uh, in order for these uh, structures to form a coherent three-dimensional structure, um, we need this, um, these actions. Uh, so general double categories do not have a well-behaved notion of profunctor because composition by an arbitrary span of categories does not preserve colimit. So there's not a well-defined monad construction. But when you have these actions, then the span is exponentiable. So uh, you get a coherent three-dimensional structure. Um, so two years ago, I set out to define the meta-language of logics, i.e. the triple category of bifibrant double categories. Uh, this is in quotes because I didn't even know exactly what kind of three-dimensional structure it would form. Nobody knew. Um, and I had no idea where to start, and I could never have wrapped my head around such a big construction 
if not for one simple miracle. Uh, string diagrams are dual to syntax, and so together they form one language, which I'm calling color syntax. So normally people think of string diagrams as syntax as an either or choice, but because they're dual, they actually fit together perfectly and they complement each other. So the idea is a color with a symbol in there is a particular type, and a string with a symbol, R, is a particular relation between types. But before writing the symbol R, the string could be seen, could be interpreted as the whole category of relations from one type to another. And before writing the, in the colors, you could see it as the whole matrix of categories. And this, um, so just by distinguishing, uh, like combining them in one language, but distinguishing between string diagrams and syntax, um, you, um, you get a very powerful language. So the idea is a string diagram represents a general concept, and then writing syntax um, determines a specific instance. And this is very powerful because then string diagrams provide a holistic view. So now a string is not just a relation inside of one double category, but it's the hom of an entire double category. Um, so it's a string that contains many, many strings, uh, and similarly for, for colors and beads. And so you can begin to draw global structures like composition and identity of the double category as easily as you would draw a particular monad inside of the double category. Um, so this was the only way that I, what you get is that you, you're doing this massive zooming out so that you're able to look at entire, entire double categories rather than just being inside of one at a time. Um, so the question was, um, in what context is a logic a, a pseudomonad? Um, I knew that it was, um, I knew that the HOM was some kind of fibered category based on Shulman's work. He described these actions as being a vibration and op vibration action of the base category on the total category. Um, but it turns out that it all came down to understanding what was the right concept of a relation between uh, these fibered categories. The, so um, what is this I here? If Q is some kind of vibration over X and Y and R is some kind of vibration over A and B, what's the right notion of a relation between dependent categories? And this turned out to be like a, a big gap in our knowledge. This, this is completely unexplored. Um, and it turns out that the string needs to be something called a two-sided bifibration. You need to have both pushing and pulling actions in order to have a, a notion of relation that actually composes. Um, so by the time I finally figured this out, I had realized that we can see the whole picture of composition of squares rather than just composition of relations simply by drawing a big outer square as the target. So here you can read this as given a pair of squares, a pair of composable squares inside, we can form their composite outside. That's, that's all there is to it. You just read these as, the, as going from inner to outer. So now we can see, before we were just drawing composition of relations, now you can actually represent composition of squares in this way, and similarly for identity. So there is a fully three-dimensional pseudomonad construction, and every aspect of that construction, all the data structure and properties of each uh, piece of that can be faithfully represented in terms of these cubes. Yes? So am I right in thinking that, that, that these boxes now, um, the, 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 blue, the dark blue boxes, those are no longer part of the two-dimensional structure, those are part of the three-dimensional structure? You mean the, the white, these? No, no, the dark blue filled boxes. Yeah, um, so that would be, a ma the dark blue would be a matrix of functors, 
that are doing composition of relations. And then this whole cube here from these inner two beads to the outer one is a matrix of transformations. So that's the three-dimensional part. And it has um, the dark blue beads are the top and bottom faces of a cube. Well, so specifically, the inner thing is like the matrix of pairs of convergible relations. Yes. And then the yes. outer thing is just the matrix of relations. Yes. Yeah, I guess the, it's a little the, confusing because in the earlier slide, you used that like two-dimensional, like I had to realize that that, that two-dimensional, or that, that like dark blue box wasn't inside the yeah. Category. Yeah. Of the this, so now this picture makes more clear that we're we're seeing the whole structure, okay. and the hum of the double category, as in the thing that contains all the squares, is a matrix of profunctors. Um, so, you have that concat uh, composed with itself, and a matrix of transformations to to itself. That's how we're representing composition of squares. So as we see more examples, um, we'll get more of a feel for, for this. Um, so when we apply the, this pseudo-monad construction to these two-sided bifibrations, we get, uh, we get the three-dimensional structure of, um, of bifibrant double categories or equipments. Um, and it, it forms something that is essentially a triple category without interchange. It turns out that, um, that vertical and horizontal composition, actually there is no interchange. It's neither lax nor colax, and there's, there's a real obstruction there. Um, but other than that, it's an extremely rich structure. And uh, yeah, so each of these colors is a whole double category. Um, the vertical direction are vertical profunctors, horizontal are horizontal profunctors, and the outward dimension are um, double functors. And um, yeah, so let's just jump into it. Any, so we're going to focus mainly on the strings and beads in, in this. Um, so the dependent categories that contain relations and, um, and then the right concept of relation between those, which would contain the squares. All right, so the basic data of a logic is a span of categories. So a span of categories R from A to B can be understood as a category of relations and inferences that depend on uh, pairs of uh, categ categories of types and processes. Um, and so the fundamental idea of dependent category theory is the idea of inverse image along a functor. Um, so given um, like this span R uh, projecting down to A times B, um, for each pair of objects in the base, A, A and B, um, we can pull back um, to get the fiber over that pair. So this is like zooming in from a whole logic to a particular category of relations between a certain pair of types. And um, if you've ever learned any categorical logic, this pullback corresponds to substitution. And this, uh, this can actually be represented simply by writing, in, writing the pair of objects in the string diagram. So before writing, you could interpret it as the whole span. And then when you write a particular A and B, this can be interpreted as the, ca the fiber category over that A, B. And um, similarly, for each pair of morphisms, there's a profunctor that gives the sets of uh, morphisms of R that lie over a pair of morphisms. So the hum of R, the hum of a span of categories, can be drawn as a bead that connects the, um, the string R to itself along the homs of A and B. And, um, and the idea is 
um, in the same way as for the string, when we substitute a particular pair of morphisms, little a and b, uh, we can interpret this as the pro functor from the fiber over the domain to the fiber over the codomain that contains the morphisms of R that lie over the pair AB. It's the exact same idea. When we, when we plug in a particular pair of morphisms, we're zooming in to, um, to the HOM over, over that pair. Um, Any questions about this so far? Because this is kind of like, kind of laying down the foundation. I want to make sure this is clear. Yeah. I'm doing a slide scan. Yeah. So R of A zero B zero is a category. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, because, oh, because of the displayed category, Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. So you're saying that these are logics. It might be helpful to have an example showing how, like, for example, and it looks a little bit like a hyperdoc thing. That, is that an example? Uh, yeah. Can you, yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll be talking about vibrations um, as, as spans with structure. Um, so, but. But for right now, we can just take um, like cat as the classic example of a logic. And so R um, would contain profunctors, the objects. So here, this would be the category of profunctors from A0 to B0. And uh, this HOM would contain the transformations um, that, l that are framed by functors A and B, little a and little b. A logic equals equals equivalent. So in the log logic of Christian words are equivalent. So all of your favorite equipments are examples of this. Yeah, but okay, we, we can we can track it. We'll get it from okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, so to get a better view of the fibers, we can slice this down the middle. So this fiber, be, um, we can. Um, um, we can basically see the diagram in CAT that we are defining. So um, when we slice down the middle here, we get um, that R of A0, B0 is a category. And um, this R of AB is a profunctor uh, from, the, from R A0, B0 to R A1, B1. Um, so, this is giving the data of a span of categories. We're breaking it up fiber-wise into fiber categories and profunctors between them. Um, and as you can see, this um, the objects of R, as we were just talking about, can be understood as implicitly representing horizontal morphisms of some double category. And the morphisms of R uh, are are implicitly representing some squares of some double category. So the data of a span of categories is two-dimensional. And then if we add structure to this data uh, is when we enter the third dimension. So, um, so we can visualize composition in R as this cube here. The way to read this is given a morphism of R over A1, B1, and another one over A2, B2 for some composable pair. Then their composite, this outer bead, lies over the composite A1, A2, and B1, B2. So, um, so this is how we can represent vertical composition in a single picture, basically. Um, where you read it from inner to outer. So given two vertically composable squares, we can form their composite outside.
is this can you all see this Yeah. Yeah, just just solid long bars. No. Oh. What do you call those solid long bars that fell inside the circuit? Because the filled ones, the dark filled ones. String. Dark filled ones. Oh, oh. So that's composition in A, and this is composition of B. And now composition of R is this uh, is the whole cube. Um, yeah. It's, it's three-dimensional because the data of R is, is two-dimensional. And when we slice this down the middle, uh, you can see it's going from two beads to one bead. So here, um, the inner to outer becomes top to bottom. And here, we're seeing uh, the structure of the diagram that we're defining in CAT. So given a morphism over A1, B1, and a morphism over A2, B2, their composite lies over uh, A1, A2, and B1, B2. So this is the lax structure of this, uh, this map from A times B to cat. Uh, we're just, in the same way that we're breaking up the objects and morphisms of R fiber-wise, we're just breaking up composition of R fiber-wise. And similarly for identity, given something lying over a pair of objects, then its identity lies over the identities of those objects. And so altogether, what we're defining uh, is uh, what's known as a displayed category, which is a normal lax functor from A times B to cat. Um, but all that it means is we're just getting a matrix of categories and a matrix of Profunctors with composition and identity. Yeah. All right. So um, that defines the Homs of a of a double category, or like the um, the horizontal morphisms of a double category form a span of categories. Um, but now the question is, what do the squares of a double category form? They form a span of profunctors. Because you have um, you have one profunctor for vertical morphisms, and then you have um, squares depend on a pair of vertical morphisms. So they're, the thing that contains them is a span of profunctors. So this image on the left, the way we would normally draw it, is dual to this image on the right. So the spans of categories are becoming strings. And the spans of profunctors are becoming a bead um, along a pair of profunctors of the base categories. And surprisingly, this idea of inverse image of breaking things up fiber-wise had not been done for spans of profunctors. And it's surprising because it works in the exact same way when we substitute a particular pair of elements of F and G, i.e. heteromorphisms, F, G, um, the fiber over that uh, forms a profunctor from the fiber uh, category QXY to that of RAB. Again, it's just the thing that contains uh, arrows that lie over this particular pair FG. So everything works the exact same way. It's just now we're considering heteromorphisms rather than morphisms inside of a category. And what it forms is a bimodule between lax functors. So, um, <clears throat> so it's the exact same type of diagrams, except now we're thinking about actions of Q and R on I. So given uh, a morphism of Q over X and Y, and then some I over F and G, then their composite lies over XF and YG. It's the exact same idea, except now we have um, for different colors because uh, we're thinking about heteromorphisms, but it's, it's the exact same idea. Um, so again, by slicing these down the middle, 
um, we can see that what we're defining is a, is a bimodule of lax functors Q and R. Um, so, um, so spans of categories are equivalent to matrices of categories, and spans of profunctors are equivalent to matrices of profunctors. Uh, and this is, of course, functorial, so spans of functors are equivalent to matrices of functors, and spans of transformations are equivalent to matrices of transformations. Um, so this gives an equivalence between the double category of span categories and that of displayed categories. Um, so basically, we were just missing a dimension in the literature, um, which was the spans of profunctors, and this completes the equivalence of double category. Can you just use that in a different term? There's spans of profunctors, you have the span thing. What, what kinds of things are little f and little g? Profunctors. Yeah. yeah. So, it's on the, so on the right side, shouldn't there be like i of f not g not? So there's a fiber? Yes. Which yep. Is That's a good point. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's a typo. Yes, yes, yeah. So yeah. span cat is not spans of cat. It's the no, category it's where the objects are spans. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So these matrices of categories are the idea is that they're the stuff of metalogic, they're the data of metalogic, because they're what contain the um, relations or horizontal morphisms of double categories. So this is the data that we manipulate uh, in, in metalogic. But um, this is just the data, and we need to add the structure. So if a span of categories R is supposed to represent relations from, uh, from types of A to types of B, then those relations should vary over processes in A and B. We should be able to push or pull um, those relations along, along, you know, we should have some kind of uh, image and pre-image operations. So to do that, um, we have to know how a category forms a double category. So normally we think of a category as a one-dimensional structure of objects and arrows, but reasoning in a category consists of two-dimensional equalities between composites and morphisms. So the arrow double category is uh, the double category in which a square is a commuting square. And uh, double categories are monads in spans of categories, so then you can define an action on a span like R. And when you do that, uh, we get the, the really important notions of fibered category and op-fibered category as left and right modules. So this is the first example that I'd like to propose that the visual language can really simplify and clarify uh, concepts in higher dimensional category theory. Normally, we learn about uh, vibrations and op vibrations by uh, Cartesian and op Cartesian morphisms, and some people get used to it, uh, and for some people, it remains confusing and uh, a little hard to, to grasp. Um, and I want to emphasize here that actually the actions of Cartesian and op-Cartesian morphisms can actually be understood just as uh, action, like module actions. So the way to read this is given a square in the arrow double category of A and a morphism of R, then we can form this outer one, um, which is the acted uh, resulting square, which is a morphism in R. And to focus on the, just the object part of that action, on the bottom half, we can read this as given an arrow from A0 to A1 and something lying over A1, we can pull it back to get something lying over A0. So you see it's, you know, because the action is pointing in the opposite direction of the morphism, this is the familiar contravariant action that people associate with vibrations. And dually, for op vibrations, we have this push forward action. Yes? Earlier for, um, you were using A with a bar over it to denote like the generic forms, mm -hmm. but here you're using A with a bar over it to denote the arrow category? What bar? Uh, with, with an arrow over it. 
Oh, oh, it's the same. Yeah, it's the same thing because the, um, I mean, like the arrow double category is like the collage of the hum. It's the, or the uh, tabulation of, of the hum. It's like the same thing. Yeah. Okay. So I want to talk, I want to show why this is equivalent to the usual concept of a vibration because um, vibrations often look really complicated when you try to learn about them in a book. And the idea is um, that it really can just be seen as composition by squares. Uh, and the idea is that if you have an action by the arrow double category, then in particular, each morphism of A makes two special squares, which can be seen as like bending and unbending that morphism. So the unit one of A bends some morphism to, to act on something, and then the co-unit unbends that action um, back into um, just an arrow. And these are inverses, so this gives an equivalent between, uh, between arrows of R, morphisms of R lying over A, and those from uh, R0 to, into the substitution here. Um, so the, um, yeah, so we can, Think of the objects of a vibration as being horizontal morphisms from uh, the, the base category to one. We're thinking this is like a span from, from A to one. And similarly, we, we can think of the morphisms as the squares. Um, so here this is lying over the morphism little a. And then just by horizontally composing with this special unit square of A that bends it to an action, um, we're, we're saying that we can turn this morphism little r into one from r0 to A substituted into r1 here, right? And then this is an equivalence because the inverse operation is, is composing with this unbending square. Questions about this? Mm, okay. So there. So we have a dual story for for op vibration. Um, so using those same kind of bending and unbending ones. Um, a, a morphism R is equivalent to pushing forward uh, R0 um, to R1. So this is the, um, either way we're getting either a co contravariant representation for vibrations or a covariant representation for, for op vibrations. Is this, I mean, is this, does anybody have? Questions? Um, okay, so the idea is that uh, Cartesian morphisms can be represented just by bending. That, that's all. I mean, like the, the, the complicated definitions that you see for, for vibrations and not vibrations can be represented literally as just bending strings. All right, so <clears throat> now the question is, what is a relation between fibered categories? So if we think of uh, these strings as being dependent categories, what's the right concept of a relation or profunctor between dependent categories? And I was shocked to find that this has yet to be explored. It's like briefly been explored by Benabu and Stryker, but only over identities and without composition. Uh, and it turns out that fiber profunctors can be defined in essentially the same way as fibered categories. So if you, if we just think of, um, so given a profunctor F from X to A, the arrow profunctor again just consists of commutative squares. It's just that now it involves heteromorphisms rather than morphisms inside a category. So again, um, 
a profuncture can kind of expand into to form a two-dimensional structure. And again, these, uh, these equations, these commuting squares, compose horizontally. And this forms a monad in spans of profunctors. Um, this forms a, a category internal to profunctors. And so again, it makes sense to, def because it's a monad in spans of profunctors, it makes sense to define an action by it. You can again, so we can define a fibered profunctor to be a left module of an arrow profunctor. So it's the exact same picture, it's just now we're thinking about heteromorphisms rather than uh, morphisms inside of a category. So given some commuting square in F and some, um, and some element of this profunctor between the total categories, we can form uh, this outer one. So this turns out to indeed be the coherent and useful concept of relation between fiber categories, but it turns out that they don't compose. Um, this was really surprising, um, and this was something that I, I had to really uh, fight to, to fix under, under a time pressure. It turns out they don't compose because when you compose profunctors, you have to quotient by associativity, right? And so uh, a pair F0, G0 is equal to some other pair F1, G1. If there's some way of factoring something out of F0 to bring it to G1 or vice versa. And so because those equalities can go both directions, the identities of a composite profunctor are arbitrary zigzags that do any amount of factoring from one side and adding to the other. So the idea is that this, um, these zigzags involve arrows pointing both directions. So if you only have one direction of action, it's not enough to represent these, um, these zigzags. So we need both a pushing and pulling action um, to have a well-behaved notion of relation between dependent categories. Um, fibered categories form a virtual equipment, but they don't compose. Off-fibered categories form a virtual equipment, but they don't compose. But bifibrations actually form an equipment. They have, they have profunctors that compose. So that's, that's um, the key to the whole construction. So the structure that we really want to consider is um, essentially the union of the arrow double category with its opposite. So what I'm calling the weave double category is the co-product of the arrow and the op arrow double categories in the two category of double categories on A. So this structure is generated by squares of the arrow double category and then squares of the op arrow double category, which are like exactly the same, but just mirror image. Um, plus, the only thing that's subtle about the construction is you need to adjoin an isomorphism between the identity arrow and the identity op arrow so that you have one identity that works for both kinds. And it turns out that's all there is to it to be able to like union these two together. And then you have a double category where arrows point both directions. So is it a co-product or a co-product? just a co-product, yeah. Because we're in the thing of double category structures on A, so it already knows about the identity. Yeah, yeah. So it was sort of a push out into the hood. Sure, in sure. In a way that like the product in the slice category is pulled back into the hood. Yeah, so it has a simple definition, but the structure actually turns out to be surprisingly complicated because um, you can take arbitrary composites of squares. So here's a square, here's an op square, here's a square. But here, this middle one, uh, because it involves an identity, you could use that isomorphism to turn it into a forward identity. And then, because these are all pointing forward now, you could have one big square um, that's recognizing some equation here. So, um, it turns out, so this is, a, this is an example weave from the top zigzag to the bottom zigzag. And these are uh, surprisingly complicated and I haven't yet found a normal form for them, but it, it, might, it probably exists. There's only a couple complexities that are given by this kind of phenomenon. But I would argue that this double category is the equational logic of, uh, of a category. 
because this, um, these associativity zigzags cannot be expressed. You might look at a narrow double category and think, oh, all equations of A could be expressed there. But actually, these zigzags cannot be expressed. And so this union where arrows point both directions, I would argue, is the equational logic of, of a category. So, um, so this is this structure is a logic, i.e., a bifibrant double category, because you have arrows um, point either direction. You have companions and conjoints. And by the universal property of coproduct, an action by this by this weave double category is equivalent to an action by the arrow double category and an action by its opposite. So its modules now are bifibred double categories rather than just fibered or outfibered. We have both push and pull actions. Uh, could you briefly address the magnet point? Okay. Okay, so that was like the key to everything. So once you have that, we can define a two-sided bifibration as a bimodule of these weave double categories. So it's like a, fi a bifibration on both sides. We have both push and pull actions by both A and B. And uh, I just want to emphasize that every aspect of these structures can be faithfully represented as these cubes. So here, the associativity isomorphism, for example, can be drawn as a cube with the source on the top and the target on the bottom. So here, acting by green first and then blue is isomorphic to acting by blue and then green. See that? Uh, and similarly, for all, the other, uh, for all the other coherences, the left and right associators and the left and right unitors can be drawn as cubes. And moreover, their coherences can even be drawn as single cubes. If you've ever heard of the idea that you can represent a coherence equation like the interchange law just by drawing one picture and declaring it to be well-defined, i.e. the two ways of constructing that picture are equal, same idea here, that the two ways of reassociating a composite are equal, that's the pentagon identity, and the two ways of reassociating a unit are equal, which is the triangle identity. So every little aspect of this complicated structure can be faithfully represented in these cubes. So then we do the same thing with profunctors. We take their, the union of an arrow profunctor with its opposite to get a relation between these two-sided bifibrations. And this, it, this is um, the most novel structure because it's a genuine relation between dependent categories. We did not have this before. We only had um, we only had dependent categories and functors between them, but this is this is a relation. Um, and same idea, every aspect can be represented in these cubes. And then to compose them, um, because they're bifibrations, we can now represent the um, these associativity zigzags of a composite profunctor here. Um, so the tricky part about composing relations of dependent categories is that you're trying to index over a quotient. So your indices are only determined up to associativity. So um, you need to form a certain quotient saying that this inner one is equal to this outer one for any way of reassociating those, those indices of the base. Okay. So, um, so these form matrix categories or two-sided bifibrations form a logic. Um, bifibrations form an equipment over categories. Uh, and moreover, it's a, it's a double fibration, i.e. the composition gets along with the fibration structure. So this is an extremely rich structure. For every pair of categories, you get an entire equipment of uh, bifibrations over them. And, um, and we've formed this middle slice here. And then the last part is horizontal composition. Um, so the last thing I want to emphasize about this language is that there is a higher dimensional version of the coend calculus, which is just un extremely, extremely powerful. So to compose these things, it's, a, it's like a weaker version of a coend. Instead of quotienting for associativity, you adjoin a, an associator isomorphism, and it forms something called a co-descent object, uh, is a higher version of a coend. Um, 
Uh, and everything works perfectly, except it turns out that this uh, horizontal composition does not preserve vertical composition. Uh, we had never explored three-dimensional structures in which you had bimodules in both directions. Uh, up to now, they were trivial in one direction. Um, so it turns out if one kind of composition involves like a one-dimensional co-limit and the other one involves a two-dimensional co-limit, um, there is no interchange. So what I'm calling a meta-logic is essentially a triple category without interchange. Um, and it's described by breaking things back up into a span of span categories rather than a span of double categories. And you just um, define vertical composition this way and horizontal this way, but just without requiring interchange. So a lax triple category or colax would be a special case of this, of this structure. Okay, so we maybe start with that yep. definition of issue? Yeah. Basically, I just want to emphasize that the um, double categories have two kinds of profunctors, which are very different. Um, and uh, I think therein lies much of the complexity of category theory. And the co-descent calculus is, uh, is extremely powerful. And I would argue that in a precise sense, this language is the canonical meta-language of category theories. Um, and this, it defines a, a research program for, for systematically unifying much of category theory. So if you're interested, um, there is a sign-up sheet for a research seminar sometime next year. Um, and if you're interested in the education program, uh, let me know. Thank you. Back to my previous question about the logical interpretation. So you mentioned that there are these two kinds of profunctors with these double categories. Yes. Can you help me see what kinds of ways they get you translate to logic? Like, like yeah. Like yeah. So a way to get a feel for the difference between these two that uh, Owen and I were just talking about a couple days ago. If you let double categories just have one object and one vertical morphism, so we're thinking about monoidal categories, then the vertical profunctors are monoidal profunctors, and the horizontal ones would be actigories, biactigories. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, you can think, the, the point is that the vertical ones contain vertical heteromorphisms, things like functors, and the horizontal ones contain horizontal ones, which are like profunctors. Yeah. Could yeah. we also hypothesize that if you have a monoidal profunctor between two monoidal categories, then you should get an, at least for one of them. Ver uh, vertical. A vertical profunctor between the corresponding matrix categories. Like, like yeah. the rich cat, like the equivalent of a rich category. Yeah. yeah, right now, Shulman's construction of a double category from any uh, monoidal bifibration, when you have like, for example, um, you know, families of V over set, you pull it back along the product of set to get matrices of V. He gave like the general construction of ways of, that's, that's what I'm calling matrix logic, is the, the way of constructing logics from monoidal bifibrations. He gave it just for these and functors between them, but actually it should, yeah, it should be, uh, it should act on profunctors between bifibrations as well. Um, so that would be a way of generating um, that would be a way of generating um, vertical profunctors between logics as well. I need to, in rich category construction, it's not just functorial in V, it's profunctorial. Exactly, too. yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I know you all have uh, used monoidal profunctors a little bit, right? I feel like they're, they're largely unexplored, but I, I feel like I feel like 
one of you has. <laughs> it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so what else? One thing I might uh, anticipate people saying is, well, not everything forms an equipment. What about virtual equipment? This actually does, uh, this framework does generalize to virtual and actually the polycategorical versions as well. Um, and if you are interested in that, I, I would be very happy to, to explore that. And also, um, this defines a general pseudo-monad construction. Um, so uh, this was just one application of that construction to give normal equipment. But you could form all kinds of structured equipments by starting with different kinds of structured categories. So Evans uh, Cartesian equipments, you could start with Cartesian categories and do repeat this exact same construction uh, and get the triple category or the meta logic of Cartesian equipment. All, all kinds of flavors of structured equipments in this way. Yeah. Is that in your thesis? No, no, just, yeah, just, just the basic construction. Yeah. Sorry, is the basic construction that you just said in your thesis for structured categories? No, okay. just, just for categories, yeah, yeah, for regular equipment. Thank you.